Hi, I'm Eddie Shepherd, and I'm a chef specialising in modern, really high-end plant-based cuisine. And today I'm going to talk you through the process of how I work on a new dish for my tasting menu. So if you're not already aware of what I do, to give you some context, I cook a modern, creative, plant-based tasting menu with the aim being to be at that Michelin star standard. I'm just cooking for eight guests tonight, cooking and serving for them entirely on my own, which has its own unique set of challenges, but also its own huge creative benefits. It's really important to me to always be working on new creative ideas, but I also have to balance that up with the fact that tickets for my tasting menu sell out about six months in advance, and so guests have often been waiting a long time to come and eat with me, so I really don't want to serve them anything that isn't perfect and isn't the very best that it can possibly be. So new dishes have to come up to a real standard before I feel like I'm ready to test them out on the public. My menu changes really quite slowly and quite gradually. For someone that's almost always working on numerous new creative ideas, it actually takes quite a long time for new dishes to make the menu for me. And that's for a few reasons. One of them is that I'm working on my own, so as well as the creative work, I'm also having to do all the prep and the actual service for my guests but also you get to a point where you reach a certain level with the food and anything new that's gonna go on the menu has to be better than the thing it's replacing. And that gets harder and harder and harder to do. I try not to repeat flavors or ingredients across the course of the tasting menu. And I really want each dish to have its own personality so that although you're having a lot of courses, each of them should be really distinct, memorable and stand out on its own terms. My food and my style is very minimal in terms of the number of flavors or number of elements within a dish. I'm almost always trying to have no more than three elements or three main flavors within a dish, but then I'll go to pretty extreme lengths to make sure that those elements are as delicious and as vibrant and express the ingredients as, as clearly as possible. Then there's the presentation and how the guests interact with the dish. This is the last thing that I come to once all the flavors, the techniques and the textures are all really nailed, but it is really important to me. My food has uh, quite a distinct visual style and I want you to be able to look at a dish that I've made and know that that is something from me. And then how the guests interact with that dish is also really important, especially when you think about having a 12 course tasting menu over the course of four hours. If all of these dishes came out presented the same and you interacted with them the same, eating with a knife and fork, that becomes kind of a bit monotonous over a long period of time. So if the different dishes have you engaging with them in different ways, things that you eat with your hands, things that you interact with in a slightly unusual way, that all helps to make those dishes more memorable, to keep the experience lively and to keep you really engaged with the food that you're having. The very last thing I would say about how I work on dishes is that whilst my food's often described as being modern and creative, actually what's going on behind the scenes is quite a lot of classical technique and quite a lot of simplicity in terms of flavors. I'm really not into putting weird food combinations together. I really don't want to try and force odd flavor combinations. And the one or two places on my menu where something might seem like a sort of slightly unusual flavor combination, there's usually a really solid bit of theory and logic behind that. And that's another thing that I'll talk about a little bit in this video. So that's the context for working on this dish and where it would fit within the tasting menu. I knew I wanted to work on something small that you'd eat with your hands and something that was going to be served in the first couple of courses while guests are still just sort of settling in. So because of that, it needs to be really delicious, really familiar, but also quite striking. I'd chosen potato as the ingredient that I was going to focus on for working on this dish for a few reasons. It's really familiar to everyone. There's an awful lot of different approaches and different preparations that you can take with potato. I feel like there's a lot of scope to be creative with it, but also it's still familiar and something that I felt like I could do something interesting with that would really work in my style of food. I worked on this dish on and off over the course of a few months and it took a little while for it to come together, which is going to seem ridiculous when you see 
see how simple the actual finished dish is. So probably the most promising of the ideas and the approaches that I ultimately rejected was the idea of confiting potato, filling it with a flavorful filling and then tempura battering it. And this is probably something that I will return to maybe with a different vegetable in the future because I was getting really great results, but it just wasn't quite right for what I was looking for for this particular dish. Confiting vegetables, cooking them in oil is a technique that I really like because it gives you an awful lot of control over the cooking process. You can treat those vegetables very delicately. You can use flavored oils so you can be introducing interesting other flavors into the dish. And also it's a way of introducing more richness into a dish, which again is something to maybe have in the back of your head if you you're working on plant-based dishes. The thing that I did keep from my trials with the confit potato was the filling, which was a smoked olive oil emulsion mixed through with Pecorino Romano. The smoked olive oil emulsion gives a really nice depth of flavor through the smokiness, and then you get this lovely umami from the Pecorino Romano. The emulsion's nice and simple to make. I smoke olive oil using oak, then make an emulsion with that, and I have a separate video on how to make plant-based emulsions. And it's a really useful way of adding some richness to plant-based dishes. Then because you have that nice reassuring umami from the pecorino, you've got a really nice balance, satisfying, familiar feeling dish, but still something that I felt I could make something quite unique out of. Then for the potato element, I ended up going really classical in the end and making a potato terrine. You take incredibly thin slices of potato, I do this on a rotating Japanese mandolin, and then you layer them up in a tray. They get baked in the oven, and then after they've been baked, they get pressed and you get this lovely, delicately layered potato terrine. And then afterwards you fry these and when you eat them, it just sort of flakes apart in your mouth. It's got a really beautiful texture. They're sort of like the best chips that you've ever had and just super, super delicious. So there you've got this fried potato terrine and this smoked olive oil and pecorino emulsion, which are really delicious together. But I still wanted one more element. I wanted to add a little bit of acidity to bring a little bit of contrast to the dish. So I tried working with malt vinegar, which is a flavor that I really like and has an awful lot of nostalgia for me. And I also tried some different pickled elements and they worked, but they were just lacking a little bit of freshness that I wanted. And in the end, I settled on using blood orange, uh, which might seem a bit unusual, but actually is a really comforting flavor combination and comes across really familiar and almost nostalgic in this in a way that I'll explain in a second. So the blood orange element that I ended up using for this is a blood orange reduction. This is something that I make in the rotary vacuum evaporator. And again, I have a separate video on the rotary vacuum evaporator, but essentially what it lets me do is either distill things at low temperature, or you can also use it to reduce ingredients down, but at low temperature. It's a machine that operates under a vacuum and under a vacuum liquids boil at lower temperature. So I can take something like uh, fresh blood orange juice and I can put it in there and have it boil at basically room temperature. So I can boil off the water, concentrating the flavor of the blood orange without ever heating it up above room temperature. So you end up with this concentrated reduction, which has this powerful, really strong, really concentrated blood orange flavor, but it's never heated up. So you never lose the vibrancy and the freshness of the blood orange. It's a super cool technique. It's something I use in a couple of different ways. And what's great is that you end up with this really concentrated, really vibrant flavor, and it's not damaged at all by heating. So I'd actually been making this low temperature blood orange reduction for quite a while, for the past two years, and it is so delicious, but I'd never had it on the menu because it just never had quite the right dish where it fitted in. So it was fantastic to find that it just worked perfectly with this. And one of the reasons I think it works so well is because you have this balance of sweetness and acidity. And with something like potato, that's actually something we're really familiar with. When you think about what ketchup is, it's this balance of sweetness and acidity. And the finished blood orange reduction, whilst it does not taste like tomato ketchup, actually in terms of its sweetness and acidity has a similar profile on those particular things, but just with this really beautiful, fresh, aromatic orange element to it. So the final piece of the puzzle for this dish, now that I have my flavors and my textures all working in the way that I wanted, is how it was gonna be presented and how the guests were gonna interact with it. And the most challenging element of that was how to serve the blood orange. So I ended up serving the potato and pecorino element of this dish on these beautiful bespoke glass plates that I'd had made. Uh, and they're served between two guests for you to eat with your fingers. 
the thing that was trickiest was getting this blood orange element right and in the end I ended up making my own little service pieces so I could serve just the portion size of the blood orange that was right for this dish and serve it again in a slightly unusual way. So to make these service pieces for the blood orange I ended up getting these pieces of stabilised wood which are dyed with coloured epoxy resin. I take the stabilised wood and cut it down to size and then drilled holes in it which would fit these little glass tubes that just hold the perfect portion size of the blood orange. Then the wooden service pieces get sanded and polished and you can see the finished element here. And so this ended up being the finished dish, the fried potato terrine with the smoked olive oil and pecorino romano emulsion and the low temperature blood orange reduction which the guests pour over themselves at the table and then eat the whole thing in one bite. So it's a really simple dish but really effective and maybe so simple that it doesn't warrant the amount of explanation that I've given you today but I hope you found it interesting and maybe it gives you a bit of insight into how I work on quite a niche and quite particular dish for my tasting menu that had to fit early on within the rest of the menu and as I said earlier on I will be doing separate videos on principles behind how to construct a plant-based dish, how to maybe make something a bit more substantial and make sure that it's balanced and doing some analytical discussion of how I structure my tasting menu and some of the dishes and ideas behind sections of the menu. So I really hope that you've enjoyed that. If you have, please give me a like and hit subscribe. I'm on Patreon so you can get more content and see recipes and Q&As and other things like that from there. Um, thank you very much and I'll see you soon.